it's my honor to introduce you first. And uh, Mr. Ludo Pais, who is the founder and the president of uh, uh, Aeropa Group, the partner and the co-founder of uh, Lantena Capital, the former vice president of HP, and uh, Ludo has uh, worked as a organizational development specialist as from the beginning of his career with management jobs at GE and uh, especially at uh, HP headquarters, where he was a VP organization development responsible for making HP a more cost driven organization, which resulted in restructuring the total HP organization and making from HP a process driven organization. And uh, his company, Aeropa, specialized in implementation of large change management project for multinationals. And uh, I think maybe Ludo can share more details later. Uh, and I want to say Ludo is uh, six, seven years old now, holds a master in uh, economy and psychology and an MBA Harvard, speaks five different languages and has a lot of the practical experience in different markets, including Europe, US, Southeast Asia, China, Latin Americans, Middle East. Whoa, so you are so experienced. And as the founder, president of uh, Aeropa and a chief innovation architect, he positions himself as the evangelist of the new IC accounting system in the knowledge economies. He is a respected keynote speaker and a teacher at several reputed universities on the IC subject and is leading an R&D center in Barcelona, where the new application areas are constantly developed. Ludo feels at home in creating new application areas in the field of uh, intellectual capital accounting. And uh, today, Ludo will give us a lecture identifying the real TKM value of a snow and a medium enterprise. So let's warmly welcome Ludo to give us a speech. Thank you, it's your turn. Hey, hello. Did Ludo drop the line? Let's wait for one minute. Hey, hello, Mr. Ludo. I cannot hear you. Do you hear me? Yes, now perfect. All right, something happened. I don't know what. <laughs> so I reconnected. No and, worries. Yeah, no I am. Worries. <laughs> so. yes. And uh, it'll be perfect if you can open your camera and uh, share your screens. Then it's your time. I did it. I did it. Yeah. Do you see okay. me now? Yeah. Uh, All right. yeah. Yeah, please. So we probably need to another one or two minutes.
So after Ludo's presentation, we have another one, Dr. Riza. And uh, after that, we will take a break, probably 10 minutes. Jack, do you hear me? Yes, I can Hello? hear you now. Okay, okay. I have, we had some problems uh, apparently with the Zoom connections. I don't know. Okay, but anyway, cool. now it's perfect. Now it's perfect. Okay. So, shall I start? Yes, please. Yes. All right. Attend. So, thank. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, uh, may I add something to the introduction? Because I, my company, Ariopa, is not only specialized in change management, but we are a very big expert since 1997 about measuring intangible assets. And that is I what see. I'm going to talk about, uh, because that is uh, more important than, well, it's not more important than change management. It's always something that uh, every company needs. But measuring intangible assets, put it on the balance sheet, Turn tacit into explicit so that you make a value in the companies so that they can go to financial institutions where they can then have uh, oh. loans or equity and what have you. So that is what we do because uh, we do have quite a lot of networks uh, who are doing that already. And that is correct what you said. We are doing that worldwide. Uh, we are 650 people um, uh, that are working every day on that, uh, and it is in the US, Latin America, Europe, uh, Southeast Asia, China, uh, everywhere. We are everywhere with our uh, proposals. And what I want to do is to share some ideas and to uh, show the people what uh, what it can be done and what is it what we are talking about. Because tacit is nice, but tacit yeah. for auditors and accountants have no value. So if you cannot turn tacit into explicit, if you do that, then you are in line with the EIS 38 standards, which is the accounting standards for auditors and accountants, which says that an intangible asset should be identifiable, controllable, and should create future economical benefit. So from, uh, um, oh, share my screen. Uh, then, yes, uh, you can share your screen. Uh, okay, okay, okay uh with my presentation that's what she asked right uh, pum, pum, pum. uh then i have to look for my screen i didn't uh, thought that i had to do that wait a second let me uh pum, 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 pum. then i have to go for um the one that min sent me um, I right, come on. Um, so I thought that we could uh, do the, or maybe uh, our facilitator can help you to share the. No, no, no it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. No Here worries. it comes. No worry, it, it's there. <laughs> we only have to open it, and then I go back, and then I can show it. So, so in the meantime, while it's opening, uh, I can continue a bit about what you're saying. Um, uh, la, la. Allez, come on. <laughs> yeah, that's always if you have to, if you're in a hurry, then always do things. <laughs> Here we go. All right, now I will uh, share it. All right, so here we go. Uh, 
has been a long tour before I was there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, now you got it. <laughs> yes. All right, so <clears throat> sure. let me, uh, shall I start in the presentation quickly? All right, so sure. when I, uh, what I was uh, what I was saying is that intellectual capital these days uh, becomes in our economy very important. Our economy these days, in where it was in the past, um, maybe I can skip a few slides in to share to gain some time. Um, in the past, if you see in the 1975s, the companies, the big companies who were at that time leading the value on stock markets and what have you, that were IBM, ExxonMobil, Procter & Gamble, GE, 3M. In many ways, they were, at that time, companies were manufacturing companies. If we jump to 220, then you see automatically that the balance value of companies are not manufacturing companies anymore. Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook. And I don't want to to say too much to the big organizations because we are talking, and the previous speaker was also talking about that, that, um, that tacit knowledge is something that is residing even more in uh, SMEs and startups and spin-offs and what have you. But there is a classification that we need to do. We have to see that the company can start from one person working on something creatively, whatever, but there are some moments, and there it's interesting to have a combination with two things, organizational development, change management, if you want, and uh, intellectual capital accounting. Well, it's to see that um, on the crisis moments of organizations, for example, if you are 20 people, then everybody starts to look and do more, um, how would I say, um, uh, structural things, processes, hierarchies, uh, uh, what have you, they have to be installed. That is explicit knowledge, and that has a value if you go to the balance sheets of, uh, of organizations. So in that sense, uh, from one person to 20 people, 150, 500, 3,000, and you have the multinationals. Here is an example of the multinationals, but it is a little bit the same um, in every organization. And the nice thing is that if you talk to any organization, uh, for example, a big multinational, has still a lot of um, uh, intangible assets. Most of the companies, they think that uh, big organizations do have um, a lot of organizational structure value, but that is not true. Have a look. This is something that is true for most of the organizations, multinationals included. That is that, for example, if they are uh, like a caterpillar, because this is an example of caterpillar, they say that the market cap, the value, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> so that the market value of a company is, let's say, 1.6%, uh, then they have 2,000 accountants working on that. But if you then say, yeah, intellectual property, that's something that everybody then say, that is a tangible asset, right? So if it is a tangible asset, it's very nice, but there is only a little bit you see there in the red left corner, there is only a between two and 3% value in, in uh, the, the protected IP. That means that there is a lot of uh, knowledge that is still to be documented. If it is documented, it is good. That is what we call the other 10%. There is 15% in multinationals, for example, of uh, explicit, um, uh, explicit knowledge. And 85% in multinationals is also still tacit. Now, that means that tacit is a very important element in organizations. Now, if you want to manage this, and that is all about, the, that's the story of our life, if you want, how to manage this tacit knowledge and how can you turn tacit knowledge into explicit. So that is the mission. Now, so if you want to do that, uh, first of all, you have to understand what intellectual capital is. So intellectual capital has actually four dimensions. You have human capital, which is in many cases, the knowledge of the people. You have customer capital, working with the customer as a company that you're now a small or a big one, working with customers. They also give you knowledge in all the deals and the collaboration models that you have. We call that customer capital. 
And of course, if you work with strategic alliances and with uh, uh, subcontractors and partners and what have you, they also give you some value and knowledge. And most of the time it is tacit. And all that together, if you can capture it, store it and make it reusable, then we are going to call it structural capital. And that's the link towards the value calculation of companies. And that is something that we have to take care of. Because if we don't do that, yeah, uh, then we will get uh, in a big uh, problem with all our companies in the world where we have now uh, more than 80% knowledge companies working. If you go and look, for example, at the, um, the uh, let me say, uh, if you look at the organizations of today, right, then you see that the organizations of today, um, 80% of it is all knowledge company. And if we then look at the financial structures that there are existing, think about balance sheets or what have you, or uh, banks who have to manage or check what companies are doing and how can we give them a loan and how are we going to me measure all this, they are stuck because old fashioned accounting is based on um, uh, uh, most of the time it is based on manufacturing companies. It's uh, basic goods in a warehouse, machine parks, finished goods in a warehouse again. But in a knowledge company, you don't have basic goods in a warehouse. You don't have uh, manufacturing tools. You don't have finished goods in a warehouse again. So that means that the accounting systems of today will never support the value creation or the value measure of the knowledge companies of today. Now, if we have that, yeah, that is of course a very important element that we have to keep in our mind. That is that we cannot uh, measure with old fashioned techniques. We have to do something new. Now, I mentioned already that uh, when you have a lot of tacit knowledge, that is not good for accounting reasons. Because remember that I said there is a measure that we need to follow, which is the EIS 38, International Accounting Standard Number 38, which is called intangible assets. They define it as identifiability, controllability, and future economical benefit. Now, if you have that, right? If you can do that, then you can talk accounting. Then you can talk value. So there are not only what we call the, the protecting knowledge values of intangible assets and, and make it tangible because everybody thinks that the patent is a tangible asset, but it is not true. It is only a tangible asset on the moment that you create the process that makes a product and creates revenue. Otherwise, it is not value, right? So in that sense, we have to adapt a way or find a way out where we going to change this kind of... Uh, um, how would I say, accounting approaches towards the people who supply companies with money, but rather debt financing or equity financing. And that is a very important thing because we can talk a lot about the value of tacit knowledge uh, that we can turn it into explicit. But if the bankers nor the investments, venture capitalists and equity funds don't understand what we are talking about, yeah, on that moment, we have a, a clash the SMEs will never get a loan, for example, if they would go to a bank and the banker will always ask them the balance sheets of the last three years. And in many situations, those SMEs don't even exist three years. They only are existing a few months. How can they justify classical thinking um, what it is? So we have to move on to a new uh, approach. So the new approach is actually based on what we call turning tacit knowledge into explicit. Now, tacit knowledge into explicit, uh, you have to do that with a, a model that we have here, but I will come back to that. Um, tacit, turning tacit knowledge into explicit means that you have to go and capture, store, and make reusable the knowledge of a company. Let me give a few examples. If you have, for example, a network from a sales rep. Now, everybody always says when I recruit a sales rep, that's very nice. And then uh, he has a, got a lot of connections and what have you. But imagine now that that uh, wonderful sales guy 
that you hired is not uh, working for you anymore and he leaves on that moment the value of his network is gone together with him so that means that the value of the company will go down and that is also true not only for a sales rep with these networks that he has but it is the same for a researcher a researcher who has a lot of creative ideas and is working on a lot of things imagine he goes away tomorrow there is the value of the company walking out of the door now if you are an investor or a banker and you know that that is a risk well then we have to deal with that now how do you do that well first of all we identify what we call the key knowledge carriers for example the the super sales guy with the big network the researcher uh, but also the marketeer or uh, the business developer or what have you yeah they all have very creative processes and the creativity where also the previous speaker was talking about well that creativity we need to capture store and make reusable what does it mean if i capture it write it down in one or another way or record it i can store it in a, in a software database or whatsoever and i train other people in using it then it becomes a value for a company now that is important to understand so tacit knowledge and talking about tacit knowledge is not enough if we want to help our smes in the world then we have to do the capturing story making reusable and on that moment you will go from a low value as you know uh, i said already with the audit standards uh, when it's not identifiable, controllable, and future economical benefit, tacit knowledge is not identifiable because that's a creative element. It's not controllable. You cannot control it. And in many cases, it doesn't have even future economical benefit. For example, if uh, somebody is inventing stuff that nobody wants to buy. Now, in that sense, if we capture it, store it, and make it reusable, on that moment, let me give an example how that works go back to our sales rep with his network well if we then send another sales rep together with the guy to the people that he knows then we have a double introduction that means that the guy who had the network has them the contacts but the other guy working for the same company of course yeah has also the contacts and on that moment we can start to see that in, and of course it will be the case that the other one has not the same relationship as the first one so there will be a value decrease but anyway there is already a part that is uh, uh, owned also by the organizations and the companies and that's a very important element yeah if we do that for all what we call the key knowledge carriers in the processes uh, let me give a few examples that are not managers you know a manager is somebody who is doing what we call work center activities uh, work center activities means that you are doing about 85% um, explicit or, or tasks. For example, an accountant, he always does the same thing and only 15% to solve problems. Where a key knowledge carrier, for example, creative person, 85% tacit and maybe 15% or less explicit because he doesn't like it to write things down. So if we identify them like that, so that are the creative people in organizations take an organization of 500 people about 20 of them are the key knowledge carriers so it is very essential if we are going to finance uh, the smes the knowledge companies of the future of today yeah then we have to go and identify them capture their knowledge store it and make it reusable so we can increase the value of a company otherwise yeah, we are going to lose the people if uh, not in um, in a special thing. Now, what we also do, and of course, I can go into the details of all this. Uh, it is very nice to see how we do that. We have, for example, um, a system where we identified all the what we call added value creating phenomena for um, for companies. Uh, and what is an added value creating phenomenon? Now, for us, intellectual capital, uh, tacit and explicit knowledge, in the case it is knowledge human related, or it is customer related in the uh, relations that we have there. In many cases, that's also knowledge. 
the same with uh, subcontracting and partners and alliances and what have you. Now, if we do that, then of course we have, um, we need to measure the present and the future value. The difference between intellectual capital accounting and classical accounting is that classical accounting is based on the past. And knowledge companies don't have a past. And even if they have a past, the things they were using at that time are not valid today. So we have to focus on the present and the future. Now, if we do that, yeah, of course we need to measure that. And I explained already that we can turn tacit into explicit, but how do you then do that? Well, there is a simple explanation with a very complex measure system behind. The simple explanation is that we are going to, um, uh, to identify the added value creating phenomena in an organization. And in simple words set, the added value creating phenomena means that we are going to, um, to look at all the evidence that companies have if you want to add something to your organization. For example, I recruit a person, or I have a new IT system, or I have a new structure, or I have a new partner or a new customer. Each time you add value to your company. Now, if that's the case, right, on that moment, if you want to add value to your company by identification of the added value creating phenomena, we identified 77 of this kind of um, activities in it. Now, how do you then turn that added value creating phenomena into a measure system. So what we did, and let me try to give an example. If you recruit a person that is an added value creating phenomena, you are going to add value to your company. Now, you don't recruit a person. You recruit his experience, his networks, his um, intelligence, his skills, uh, is motivation, is environmental support, and what have you. So there are many variables and parameters that should be measured on that time. There are 77 added value creating phenomena, and you will see that in the in the uh, the model that is also in the presentation. This one, oh sorry, <clears throat> um, that one. It doesn't want to stay there. So it uh, you will see it there. And what we then did is we uh, created from all the variables and parameters measure systems. And the measure systems are, are based on econometric formulas. And in each of those 77 econometric formulas, there is always a financial element and dimension into it by which you are talking about money. And that for me is a very crucial point. If we want to make um, a tacit knowledge, explicit knowledge, knowledge companies, and what have you, um, make that work in our society, then we need to talk about money. Because I have never seen a company where the, the, they can invent a lot of things yeah, without having grants, uh, uh, loans, uh, or investments from either the people themselves or external investors. And of course, those people don't understand always what people are doing in an SME. So in that sense, we have to translate that in a language that they can do. Now, one of the elements that I want to talk about here, it's a very important one. And that's something that um, we talked already about with Fisher to, to go and do that even in China. Uh, I mentioned already um, that uh, bankers are not so willing to give loans anymore. Yeah, uh, so otherwise they always say, if you go as an entrepreneur to your, uh, to your bank, and you say, can I have a loan? Yeah, then the banker will say, yeah, can you give you your house, your dog, your wife, your car, a bicycle, whatever you have as a collateral. And then we say, this is a little bit strange eh, that you have to give your house away, which is a personal thing, has nothing to do with your, what you do in your organization. Now, in that sense, we say, well, that's strange yeah, that uh, bankers don't understand this. And understanding is the right word. If you talk to bankers about intellectual capital, accounting and measuring, they, they, don't, they, they don't want it. And on top of that, the Basel III, IV agreements even um, say that companies can, uh, or banks better said, cannot do that. So there is a big problem for all our SMEs who are going for loans. And what they then sometimes do, they go then to venture capitalists to have money, but that's equity money. 
and they have to buy, for example, a computer with equity money, which is crazy. Because if you throw the computer away after four years, and at the exit moment of the, um, the investor, you pay that computer back 100 times. So you should go for what we call non-added value uh, investments. Yeah, uh, You should do that with debt financing. So that means you go to the bank and you pay an interest and done, right? And that's much cheaper than that you would do that with, uh, with uh, uh, equity money. Now, what we then said is, yeah, because banks don't do that, why don't we give 100% guarantee to uh, the banks? So Ariopa gives a 100% guarantee to the bank based on an insurance policy concept. And that means that the banker, they receive something that they understand. Yeah, they don't understand intellectual capital. They don't understand knowledge companies. They don't understand tacit. They are afraid of tacit if you even talk about it. So in that sense, if you do something much more, uh, uh, um, well, you give them something that they understand, that's their language, then it will work. So what we do is we give 100% guarantee to the, uh, to the banks uh, on behalf of the SME. Now, everybody says, are you crazy? Because uh, if then the SME goes bankrupt, then Ariopa must have a tremendous amount of money to pay always the non-performing loans. No, we do that differently. We, have, we do what we call a high-level estimation innovation due diligence before with the SME. What is an high-level estimation innovation due diligence? An high-level estimation yeah, has to do with, um, how would I say, the uh, the diff we we measure yeah or better said we yeah we measure the present and future value of a company in money terms and the tacit explicit balance sheet. That means that the balance between uh, explicit and tacit present and uh, explicit and tacit future we are going to bring to uh, uh, to the table. You will see. Uh, at the end of the documentation of this presentation, a balance sheet even on how that looks like. Now, that's the high level estimation we do in innovation due diligence. A lot of that means we are going to look into the future with the companies. Companies always have in the future very big plans, but we are going to check that the processes who are underpinning the, who should underpin the evolution that strategic wise thinking management or shareholders, what have you, are defining, that that is in line and supportive, that we call innovation due diligence. So high level estimation, innovation due diligence, we do before, then we give the bank the 100% guarantee. And what we also do is we put the knowledge manager inside in the organization. And why do we do, what's the knowledge manager inside in an organization? The knowledge manager inside is going to do uh, those 10 steps. That means we are going to um, do to and help the companies to turn tacit into explicit, uh, create multiple money streams. You can sell uh, knowledge in many different ways. Yeah. And you still keep the knowledge, of course, in that moment. Um, you can safeguard it in one or another way. So all these kind of things uh, need to be done in an organization. Now, if we just tell an SME that they have to do it, they will say, yes, yes, yes. And then they go back and they only do the sales of their products and they are developing their products and they forget the rest. So in that sense, what we then do is that we push, uh, we, we put the knowledge manager inside who is doing that on our behalf. Now that concept, high level estimation, innovation, due diligence, guarantee of the banks, and we put the knowledge manager inside, gives of course the SMEs the potential for uh, loans from banks. We do also the same with equity, right? So, Jack, I think that that is a little bit uh, the end of my this, uh, presentation. I can talk hours and hours about it, uh, but I think that if people have questions or whatever, so they can always come back to me, as you know. Yes. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Ludo. I think this is uh, absolutely your favorite topic. And uh, I think everybody should be you know, passionate to transfer this uh, intellectual capital, the tacit uh, knowledge, you know, into the real benefits to the organization, to the business. So thank you so much uh, for your sharing and uh, useful tours, yeah. the concepts.
Thank you so much. Jack, uh, can I say a last word? Here is what I yeah, want to show to the people. Here is yes. a balance sheet, yeah? And you see um, the balance sheet, uh, on that's a financial balance sheet, classical of an organization. This is an, um, right, come on. This is an intellectual capital balance sheet, right? That means that these are that are figures that has to do with uh, the human capital and uh, and so on that you see there all these uh, elements based on the same principle as classical accounting and look at that this is a consolidated financial and intellectual capital balance sheet where you can see the real value of a company the total owned explicit intellectual capital today four hundred and ninety seven thousand euro from that company it's a real company that we are talking about. The total not owned tacit intellectual capital is 916. Now, here you see easily what has to be done. If you then turn that tacit into explicit, your value of company goes up, right? Anyway, so that is just a, a little thing that I wanted to add to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ludo. I think this is powerful, actually. This is the first time I've seen a combination of uh, intellectual capital and uh, cost balance sheet together. Whoa, I want to learn from it. And, and Thank we you do, so much for sharing. And we do that a lot. We do that already a lot for uh, thousands and thousands of companies. Also those guarantee systems that we do, we do that in 24 regions already uh, in the world. Uh, it works tremendously, right? It works incredible. Incredible. Thank you so much. With Mr. pleasure. Little. With yes. pleasure. Have a good day. You Thank too. you. Bye for now. Goodbye. Good.